button. And all right, Larry, we're rolling. So, okay, if I go ahead and kick us off officially. Please do. All right, awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon, good morning, if you're out on the West Coast, just barely. Uh, if you're watching the recording, hope you're having a good day. Thanks for watching it. We're gonna be talking about why fundraisers should press play and not pause. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm Steven, I'm over here at Bloomerang. Uh, my Bloomerang home office, not the actual Bloomerang office, probably some of you can relate, uh, but uh, I'll be moderating today's uh, little chat here as always. Um, just a couple housekeeping items real quick. Um, we're going to be recording this session. We are recording, so if you uh, need to leave early or maybe get interrupted or just want to watch the, the uh, presentation later on or share it with a friend, uh, don't worry. I'll be sending out the recording to you uh, later on today. We'll also send you the slides. Uh, we'll get you all those goodies. Don't worry. Uh, but most importantly, as you're listening today, please feel free to chat in any questions or comments uh, that you have. We're going to try to leave some time for Q&A towards the end, uh, so don't be shy. I'll keep an eye on that. There's a chat, there's a chat box and a Q&A box. You can use one or the other. It's okay. I'll, I'll keep an eye on both of them, uh, but we'd love to hear from you. If you haven't already introduced yourself, go ahead and do that. We'd love to know who we're talking to. Tell us about yourself, where you are, what your organization does. You can send us a tweet. I'll keep an eye on the Twitter feed as well, uh, but we'd love to hear from you either way. And if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, we always have a few uh, first timers. So I just kind of like to explain Bloomerang just for context. If you've never heard of Bloomerang, we are a provider of donor management software. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out. We're not really gonna give you a commercial there, uh, but that's what we do. We do these webinars just about every Thursday. In fact, we've been doing multiple webinars um, since mid-March. I don't think I need to tell you why. Um, so if this is your first session, um, thanks for checking it out. Hopefully you'll come back. We have lots of uh, webinars scheduled on even through the summer now. Um, so don't make it your last one. Um, but speaking of webinar series, uh, my buddy Larry Johnson is joining us from, from beautiful Idaho, my, my, literally my favorite state in the union. Larry, how you doing? You doing okay? I'm doing just fine. Your picture disappeared. There's supposed to be a picture of you there. I can see it in my, my preview slide, but they can see you there on your, uh, your webcam avatar. Um, Larry, you've done... Lots of webinars for us. I think you're you're someone we always like to have back uh, every year. Uh, if you don't know Larry, he is over at the Eight Principles. Check him out. They got a brand new website. Larry just sent it for me because it's uh, really cool. I was just browsing through it. Uh, check out his book, The Eight Principles of Sustainable Fundraising. Um, I love the Eight Principles. It's a really nice framework for what folks should be doing and, and concentrating on. So um, check that out later on super involved in the nonprofit sector, been doing this for a long time, over 30 years of experience. Uh, he's worked in your shoes, you know, he's a consultant now, but he's been in, in the uh, sort of ED chief and in, in advancement officer role before. Um, so he kind of knows what he's talking about um, and serves on tons of boards, uh, including at the, the Carter Center. That's, that's, the, that's President Carter, right, Larry? Right, that's, that's, that's right. The, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. And he went to Yale. I mean, geez, he's got horses. He rides motorcycles. This is a cool dude. Um, Larry, I'm going to let you uh, share your slide. So I'll, I'll stop sharing and uh, okay. we'll see if we can make this work again. Okay. Let me see. There we go. <laughs> there Do you, it goes. See, you see me? Yeah, we see your slides. You're on. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be talking for about 20 minutes and then 25 uh, Steve's going to keep me honest in that regard. And then we're going to open it up to questions because I think questions really is where I, what I present really gets down to the retail level uh, because um, we're not going to be, I'm not going to be giving you any secret tips, techniques, or secrets. We're going to be giving you some real structural advice and it'll be up to you to be able to interpret that and apply it to your particular situation. So questions are absolutely critical, absolutely critical. So uh, thank you for taking your time to do this. Uh, of course, now with the way things are, hopefully you're having a little more time uh, uh, to do this kind of thing. Uh, so we're going to be talking about, um, let's see here. Okay, I can't make the thing, what do I need to do? Oh, hold on. Okay, I'll make, that'll work. Okay. Okay, what we're, uh, what, uh, I got the tech, okay, I got the technology. Here we go. What we've just experienced in the past couple of months is what uh, economists and other, um, other people sometimes call a black swan event. You know, for many years, black swans, they were thought not to exist until they were discovered. But yes, there are black swans and they do occur from time to time. And they are generally, um, what, what does the black swan do? Well, it, it is an unpredictable surprise 
which exploits and magnifies vulnerabilities. In this case, we're going to be talking about vulnerabilities in your fundraising. You know, what's going to happen to your fundraising is a result of what we are going to see. So the black swan event generally causes losses that are beyond what you could predict. Now, some of that, we're going to talk about what can be predicted in a moment, but generally this sort of hit you, you were not, you didn't see it coming, but yet there it is. And the goal is not try to predict these things, which you cannot. By definition, black swan events sort of come out of the blue. But what you can do is build a robustness in your program to the negative event and exploit it to your advantage. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Now, a black swan depends upon the perspective of who's looking at it. Okay? You know, your black swan may be somebody else's white swan. Uh, for instance, a black swan surprise for a turkey is not a black swan for its butcher. All right, that's a white spot of it for the butcher. It's a black swan for the turkey. All right. So what we're going to be doing is, of course, the objective, of course, is to avoid being the turkey. You don't want to be the turkey in this situation. You want to be the butcher. You want to be one who exploits the situation and uses it to your advantage. You can't predict it. You can't control it. But you can develop internal systems that will exploit it and provide you defense against it. So we're going to be talking about identifying areas of vulnerability that will turn your black swans to white ones. All right. So now let's look, let's look, be more specific with what we're dealing with right now. I'm sure all of you have asked the question of, uh, so what can I expect in the short term? You know, what, what's going to happen to my fundraising now in the next three, six, nine, maybe even 12 months? Well, that depends. That depends on where you are on the scale of of, of, of fundraising, whether you tend more to doing more transactional work or you do, do more relational work. Now, what, I'm, what do I mean by transactional? Well, I mean things that are quid pro quo. You, you buy and sell stuff, uh, or that would be all of your revenue bearing events, your cause related marketing, anything where there's a this for that. And then what I would call also blind solicitation. There's a lot of that out there. Let's get a list and just mail it to everybody. Well, that's transactional because you're attempt attempting to acquire something where there isn't anything there before. There's no prior relation. That's that's one side. If your fundraising is more relational, that that you you focus more of your revenue efforts on direct asks using donor interest in situations, and then you target them with thoughtful content communication. Every one of those words has meaning, by the way. Content communication. Notice I didn't say solicitation. That's a, that's a reason. So if, if you're more relational, then here's what's going to be your differences. Let's go back to the um, um, 2008 uh, financial crisis. And on that note, uh, today's headline in the Wall Street Journal said that the uh, economy has contracted um, about 4.8% in the last quarter. And that's not quite as bad as it was during the um, uh, financial crisis. So from a financial point of view, um, and this is and this where people put their money is a largely degree as if it's availability to them. Um, this is what we're dealing with, something about like that. It could be a little bit worse in the next quarter, but right now we are. Well, in that particular event, if you during that period of around 12 to 18 months, if your if your um, fundraising was focused on transactional efforts, you could have lost up to 60 percent of your revenue during that period, uh, mainly because those, that revenue is discretionary. If on the other hand, you're, you're the bulk of your money or your, your program was focused on relational efforts, overall you experienced about a 1% reduction. There you go. There's the difference between the robustness to buffet the black swan and then the one where it just hits you full force. So what you need to do now, of course, you can't go back and change what maybe you would like to have done by focusing on relationships if you're heavy in the transactional world. But right now, let's talk about what you can do. And it's gonna be a, a balancing act at this point. First of all, if, you are doing, if, you, if you're primarily in the transactional camp right now, you're gonna to have to fasten your seatbelt, number one, all right? And I would recommend that you continue current channels as appropriate, for instance. I've seen a lot of what they call virtual events. We'll wait and see how they work out. But I think the most important thing you could be doing now is preparing for the next black swan event. And I would recommend that you begin an aggressive program shift 
toward the relational model. If you're already doing relational work, you're going to have to fasten your seatbelt. This is going to be ups and downs. You're going to be on a roller coaster there for a while. And then I would go ahead and continue to inform and solicit. The, the, the epidemic has refocused a lot of people's attention. But you need to understand that philanthropy does not totally refocus based on external events. Philanthropy is driven by internal values. So you need to be aware of that. It, it, it will focus some income there temporarily, but it usually will expand philanthropy during that period. It won't just completely shift it. And then thirdly, if you're already in the relational thing, you should be focusing on strengthening what you already have. You're, you're in the good part. Let's keep, let's make it stronger. Let's keep it there. So how do we, you know, how, how do we go about asking for people, asking people for money at a, at a time like this? which is what you're doing. Well, the first thing you don't want to do is you don't beg, all right? Um, I've seen some things out there that I really, that, that I know these people are well motivated, but they say things like, well, now that we've got this epidemic on us, we need it more than ever, okay? Or they say, things look bleak out there, or here's how you can help us, instead of saying, here's how we you and the two of us can help others, all right? So when you use any of those three bullets up there, here's the message you're giving your donors. We're incompetent, we didn't plan ahead, you know? We need it now because it caused flat-footed, things are bad and, and we need your money. And the response from a lot of donors is going to be, I don't trust you, I'll just look elsewhere. You do, definitely don't shame people. Uh, I see a lot of this. This is sort of the entitlement mentality. Well, we deserve this. You have too much. You're not aware of what's important. Well, who's determining what's important? It should be the donors. And you have to appeal to them on that basis. Um, I saw, you know, I, I see some of these uh, uh, comment strains on some of the blogs and people were whining about the fact that why weren't, why weren't foundations just liquidating their, um, uh, their, their, their uh, uh, portfolios to hand out more cash? Well, that's really, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of that, but that's their business. And when you try to shame people, here's what you're saying to people. Well, we're morally superior. And people's response is just going to be, you're only interested in my money. And, and who the hell do you think you are? And you'll just turn people off with this kind of thing. Um, I really recommend that you invite and engage people. Together, we'll succeed. Um, I don't often name organizations, uh, but there's an advertisement on the TV from the Salvation Army that really, really does this very, very well. I was pretty touched by it. I thought, hmm, they did this really well. And that's the whole message, together we'll succeed. And then we're sacrificing by. What is it the organization is cutting back on in order to make this work? Um, let's make decisions together. You're, you're our donors, you're important to us. We want more than your money. The message is we want a partnership. Success involves everyone. And your, the response is likely to be, I'm ready, let me help. Let's, let's look a bit at what motivates people to actually make gifts. This is so important. If you look at the, you know, there are about 20 or one, 20 or 20 of these top motivators, and they can really be categorized into three categories. The quid pro quo, the something for something crowd, that's about 10%. Altruism, pure altruism, I give because it's the, it's the right holy thing to do, that's about 10%. But enlightened self-interest is 80%. What do I mean by enlightened self-interest? I mean something that is enlightened to benefit the community, but is in, in my interest, which means it's in line with my values and my visions. And so you need to remember that when you're reaching out to people. Now, as we go forward and we're into this black swan event, there are, there are opportunities within chaos. You need to know that st st stability and constancy are simply not normal. Some of you may be young enough not to even remember a, a, a recession or any kind of serious upheaval. Well, they come periodically. Um, disruption and uncertainty are the normal. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that's caused the reaction that we've had. So, you know, that, that, you know, I'm old enough to remember you know, regular summer epidemics of one disease or another, and it was a part of life. Uh, it was just there. You had to deal with it. So the point is, nothing is static. So let's go back to the black swan event again. You need to resolve now 
to grow revenue streams which are impervious to broad economic swings. And you can do this. And they are the ones that draw from relationships that create emotional ties with your investors. Emotional ties, okay? And it's ties of their emotion, not yours. And why should you do that with individuals as opposed to corporate foundations or other things? That's because 90% of philanthropy is controlled by individuals, one way or the other, either directly through bequests or through family foundations, 90% of it, 89.8 .8 or whatever it is. So as you strengthen emotional ties, the philanthropic revenue becomes impervious to economic swings. We saw that in the last one. We saw it in 1987 when the stock market had its, had its one day hiccup um, and I was old enough to be there for then. So how do you go about doing this? You know, how do you do this? Well, let's take it step by step. I think the first thing you must do is to confront your own reality, your personal organizational reality. This can be difficult because you think you're doing something a certain way or you convinced yourself that you're this or that and it's kind of hard to get out of your head. So, you know, we do something we call the Four Corners Profile, which is very simple. If you're familiar with the Boston Consultant Group, Boston Box model, it's built on the same model, although it's in fundraising, not, not corporate management. But what, we're, what we focus on are the two things you should be focusing on. How sustainable am I right now? How scalable am I right now? And so, you know, we put, we put organizations in one of those four boxes, thumbs up, high sustainability, high growth, questioning face, high sustainability, low growth, money bag, high growth, low sustainability, that would be your transactional crowd. And then low sustainability, low growth, that's your almost on the edge organization that a good, a good shove will send them over the cliff. Number two, once you have got a real sense of where you are right now, and you could be in any one of those four boxes, the next thing is to start moving to the right box and that would be the thumbs up box. And so the way you do that is you internalize the natural laws of philanthropy throughout the entire organization. Entire organization. Fundraising is not an isolated activity. Yes, you may have a professional fund development officer, but the entire culture of the organization comes into play. And whether you're in the boardroom or the reception desk, you need to understand what these laws are because you're not going to break them. You're going to have to work within them. And so what are they? Well, I call them the eight principles of sustainable fundraising. And um, I didn't invent these. I simply put names on them. And for those of you who've been in the business a while, you'll probably recognize a few of them. The first one is donors are the drivers. Donors drive philanthropy, but they don't drive it with their money. They drive it with their visions and their values. But guess what? They're in charge. Two, you must begin at the beginning. And this means that you need to begin to formulate your message to your donors in a way that they will understand. You know, I can't tell you how many nonprofit websites I get on and it reads like you know, a tax form or some sort of, it's full of jargon, it's full of stuff, I don't even know what they're talking about. They're talking to themselves, they're not talking to me. Principle three is leadership leads. This is why your governing board and your executive staff are so critical. If they're on board, if they believe in philanthropy, if they're making it a priority, the rest of the organization and your donor base will as well. If they're not, other people won't. Wherever they lead, others follow. Principle four is learn and plan. No, it's not plan and learn, it's learn and plan. And the reason why is you must first learn who would naturally support you through affinity and ability um, and, and, and profile. And then once you know what that profile is of your typical donor, then you make your plan on how to reach out to them. You know, I, you know, some of the organizations, it's just the spray and pray thing. We just get it. We, you know, we make a general announcement on TV. We buy a list and mail it to everybody. I mean, that's an incredible waste of money and time. Uh, those things are expensive and they just, they don't net what you need to be netting. Your costs go sky high. Principle five is work from the inside out. Start with those people who are closest to you by, uh, by their affinity to you and by their proximity to you. You know, you don't try to reach the whole world at once. Principle six is divide and grow. And that's a, that's a way of saying treat different donors differently. 
donors come to you in different shapes, sizes, giving abilities. They also come to you at different points in their life, which, will, which impacts the level and direction of their philanthropy. Principle seven is renew and refresh. First, renew your donors at the highest possible rate. Then, and only then, begin to refresh donors as they go away by acquiring new ones. Usually people they flip those around. So we have these pathetic, when you consider that these uh, average consumer product renewal rate is 95%. So people are more, what, low to their toothpaste than they are their charity? Whose fault is that? And then principle eight, invest, integrate, and evaluate. You have to invest in the program, but you need to invest in it wisely. You need to put the money and the time that are going to leverage the money the most. So that way you don't spend all your time with events that cost you 50 to 75 cents on the dollar. You build a strategic program that's going to cost you 15 to 18 cents on the dollar. You integrate your efforts. You don't have six different appeals to the same people. And then you evaluate them. You never, ever, ever usher those words, well, we've always done it this way. That's the kiss of death. So those are the eight principles. Number three, once you kind of know what they are, and that's only the first step, all right, being able to recite them or tell me what they are, you have to embed these in your living culture of your organization. They have to be a part of who you are. And that's, that takes work. And then as those are internalized, you need to create a plan to address methods, resources, and timeline. This is where, this is where it becomes retail. You see, and the problem is, you know, most organizations start here. They start at the process. Oh, the five tips to do this, the three techniques to do that. Well, there's only one problem with that. And that is that um, techniques and methods are situational. Where am I here? Mm -hmm. And then as these principles inform your work, then you select the methods that work for you. And they will be different depending on who you are. So when you hear the latest webinar about, oh, right now you need to be doing these three things to raise this money. Well, that's a tactic, all right? It might or it might not work for you because your situation is not like everybody else's. And you need an example. He just said to you, uh, Steve talked to you about I live in the Rocky Mountains. Well, you know, I love motorcycles. And, you know, I'll be out on a bike like that in wonderful, wide open, dry pavement. That's a great experience but I would never ever use that vehicle to drive in these conditions. A different setting. Uh, that's up near Sun Valley, by the way, up near where I live. And I wouldn't be on a bike doing that because the situation is different. I still want to get from point A to point B, but I have to get a different mode of travel, a different method. And like, it's the same thing with your organization, whether you're a youth group or education or a church or, or, or social group, whatever it is that you are, healthcare, you know, your niche is going to be a little different. So then you've got to focus on knowing the principles and how they affect your organization before you can begin to choose methods that make sense for you. So then you must create a program while you're doing this, which builds on relationships with your investors. Okay, so you're telling me, so what does that look like, Larry? Well, here's what it looks like. It's a path where donors reach their dreams. Let me repeat that. A path where donors reach their dreams. It's not your dreams, it's their dreams. So you're thinking, hmm, well, obviously, if this is gonna work, somehow those two dreams need to match up. And if you do this and do it consistently, over time. So what am I going to get out of this? Well, this is the beautiful part. I've always known this was the case, but it wasn't until just a few years ago that it was actually quantified. This is research that was done out of Texas Tech based on 200,000 organizations. And you'll see the size of the organizations at the bottom. And on the, on the left-hand side, on the ordinate, you'll see the, the gain that's achievable uh, when you focus on this asset-based giving approach, which is what this is. It's where you're building relationships with donors to the point where a critical mass, about 20% of your donors, about at least once. And it doesn't have to be large gift. See, this I spent most of my career in what they call major giving or capital giving. And uh, some of those gifts are assets, some of them were not. But the key is, is the asset gift. And what that, what that tells you is that you've achieved those high level of relational 
ties because people are closest to you and they're willing to cut a check out of an asset, not income. And this is the kind of growth you get. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And this, as I said, is based on 200,000 organizations over a five-year period. So this is verifiable. So here's, the, here's also some good news. This is an act of the will. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to have high-powered uh, development officers to do this. It helps, but it, it's, not, it's not determinant. It's a matter of, of the will. And that's where most of this breaks down. Do you have a, do you have a, a board that, that's willing to do this? Do you have an executive that's willing to do this? Or they just want to go kind of lurch from one emergency to another? So from the right perspective, sorry, from, a, from the right perspective, this could be a white swan. It, it, it's a difficult time right now. No question. We will get through this. Life will go on. And all the, all the cries of doom and gloom and irrevocable whatever, you know, in two years, that will all be forgotten at the most. So the key is to plan for the next black swan. One final thing, and then we'll go to questions. You know, what do I do? Well, we provide training to, to teach you how to do this is what we do. And, you know, most training that's out there is only short term. They don't really give you a plan. They just give you isolated techniques. It's usually not available when you need it, otherwise, meaning it's only through a cohort or it's only available when a live consultant shows up. A lot of it's pretty expensive and then much of it is not really accessible by people who are not professionals. And that's really gonna be critical if you have people you're trying to convince this is the way to go. And so what we do is we provide affordable and accessible training that does create this stable growing revenue base. And if you wanna learn more, you go to theaprinciples.com and we have a full blown online program that is custom videos, interactive exercises, online forum, and live coaching twice a month. So check us out. All right, Stephen, let's have some questions. Yeah, my favorite part. This is why we like to have Larry on, by the way, because uh, we have an extended Q&A period, which I think is sometimes better than, you know, 60 slides. So if you haven't asked a question already, please do so. I know a lot of you already have probably about maybe 20, 25 minutes for questions, which I'm excited about. Um, but first, Larry, thanks for that. Um, one of the reasons we we wanted to have you on, we've had a lot of people on. If, you, if, if folks have been following Boomerang Webinars, you know, we've had we've been covering this topic. Uh, for basically the last six weeks, I, I want to ask you the question that I've asked all of our guests first. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take the first question if folks don't mind. Um, what I've been noticing and hearing a lot, not just from Bloomerang customers, but just you know nonprofits that that I can I'm connected to is even among the ones that do have that relational, you know, kind of baseline going, which is good. There is still some hesitancy to be reaching out to those, those, those supporters of theirs, you know, the true believers that they have cultivated over a long period of time because they think their cause is not relevant right now. Um, you know, it's not, they're not feeding people. They're not helping with joblessness. You know, maybe they're a theater or an animal shelter or, a, or an environmental group. What would you say? And maybe you've heard this from some of your clients, to those people who say, we're not the right cause right now. My answer to them is, and I'm, I'm curious your take on it, you know, the people who care about your cause last month, they still care about it now, regardless of what's happening in the world. What, what's kind of your take on, on the, the folks who don't think their, their cause is, is worthy or relevant right now? Well, they're making the mistake of uh, trying to violate uh, principle one. Okay. Principle one is donors are the drivers. You said what they, the organization thinks. It's not up to them what they think. All right. Yeah. It's up to the or it's up to the donors. You're actually insulting the donor when you're assuming and making decisions for that person. Now that that doesn't mean that you are just continue to that you that you're insensitive or rude. You would never want to do that yeah. anyway. Okay. But assuming you have these relationships, they probably want to know what you're doing, how you're faring. You see, this yeah. is something that affects everyone across the board, whether it's a financial crisis, health crisis. You know, for instance, start with saying, well, we're healthy here and we're still working and we, and we, want, we want to let you know that we're still out there working for this and this because you already have that relationship. You already know that's an interest. You're not inventing this thing. All right. And so let them make their decision what they want to do. The, pres the donors, let the donors make the decision. Don't make it for them. Um, it's, it's, you know, when I was in capital fundraising, you've seen it before. 
we, we, we plan a nice high-end event for high-end potential donors, and we, we, we only get like 15 people to show up, and they want to cancel it. I'm going, are you kidding me? I'm not canceling it if, if there's one person showing up, because that is one person that said they are interested. Okay, it's, it's not a matter of numbers. And see, there we go again. That's principle five, work from the inside out. Start with those that are closest and build from them. You see, see, th see, see, a lot of this is you're thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about the donors. And that's where the issues are. That's my response to it. I love it. Um, yeah, we're getting, um, we're getting some people agreeing with that already, which is good. Uh, one person said, uh, my answer to the folks who don't think their cause is relevant is what would the community be like without you? And yeah, they want those things to be to be here when when this all is said and done. I mean, I'm I'm thinking of some organizations that you know my family uh, enjoys the benefits of that that aren't food banks and things like that. So um, I'm glad you said what you did. Um, th here, th your answer segues into a good question in here, which is those those people that are really loyal. Can you over communicate with them in any ways? You mentioned. You know, here's what we're doing here. You know, we're still here. Here are the updates. Do you think there's, there can be too much of that? I think people are trying to kind of find the sweet spot of the amount of communications they should be giving in these times. Well, you can always overreact. You can always over communicate. Um, bear in mind that the number one negative for donors is over solicitation. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm real sensitive about this. And I know I, there are people that don't agree with me, but for me, Anything that includes any reference to making a gift is a solicitation. For instance, yeah. when you get a um, hard copy report or newsletter in the mail, what do so many nonprofits, especially the smaller ones do? They saddle stitch a giving envelope in the middle of it. All right. Well, to me, that ceases to be news and becomes a solicitation. Now, in a, I know, I know why people, why they do it. Oh, I want to save money because of blah, blah, blah. Well, this isn't about saving money. It's about effective cost overall. And if you're doing it well, uh, the additional cost of mailing separately will be more than compensated for uh, with the gifts you'll receive. Uh, one of the thing, one of the groups that do this religiously over solicitate, over solicit, excuse me, are independent schools. Parents are bombarded. In September, it's this club. In October, it's that club. In November, it's something event. And by the time April rolls around, they are absolutely whooped. All right. So that when they do mail for the annual fund, they go, what? I've just been giving you money for the last nine months and I'm paying tuition on top of that. You see? So when you, the, the, when schools can budget those individual things and then only have a once or twice a year annual fund, they actually raise a lot more money. I have worked with a couple of clients like that and they, they're amazed at the change. But it takes two or three years to make that shift because you have to begin to budget those things in. Here's one um, on the topic of, of relational. Um, speaking directly to the the high turnover rate that uh, fundraising professionals tend to have, how do you balance the the relationship between the donor and the fundraiser, or maybe the ED or someone at the organization, with the relationship between the donor and the org? should that fundraiser or whatever that staff person is exit the organization? How do you kind of balance those two things? Is, 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 is staff retention kind of the main goal in your mind? Um, in a simple word, yes. Okay. Um, the, um, we could talk about staff retention for a whole session, all right? Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of reasons why. Um, why that, uh, some of them are based on the Fundraisers' decisions, some of them are raised based on what I call dysfunctional expectations and amateurish hiring. Um, it's those three things, really, that are combined together to make a perfect storm. Um, I tell, when I've worked with clients in the past, I say the fundraiser is a project manager. The fundraiser is not a gunslinger. And that comes as news to a lot of people, especially board members, when they think they've hired someone that's going to go out and bring, bring home the bacon. That's sort of the, how they see it. And the very best fundraisers are project managers because they understand that it's a team that makes this happen. Not that they're unafraid to go out and ask. Of course they go out and ask. But that's, that's not, they're not, the, the, they're not, they're not what? A paladin sent out to clean up Dodge, right? right. And, and, uh, and they, they involve a team. Uh, then, uh, then I think 
a lot of organizations put on dysfunctional goals onto these on you know, well, fundraising capacity is of your current fundraising system. I can tell you the theoretical capacity of what you're doing now. I mean, I can put a number to it, a dollar and cents number to it. And yet you have these people who set budgets based on their quote needs, whatever the hell those are. All right. You know, a system has, has a maximum regardless of what you need. All right. So then if you're going to, if you need to raise more money, you need to, you need to change your system. Mm -hmm. And that's where, um, you know, I've had, you know, head to head battles with executives, both on as staff and consultant with, and it's not about what you need. It's about what your system will raise. Now let's say, let, let's set about raising what it'll raise and then we'll talk. All right. Because so when, so when you have these, uh, when you have these organizations that put these absolutely unreachable goals onto people, well, it's going to burn them out. It's going to scare them away. Um, and they'll go and get another job. But in terms of the relational aspect, that kind of revolving door does incredible damage to fundraising programs. Uh, every, when you have a staff change, it's going to take you six to nine months to recover from that staff right. change. All right. So if you're, changing every 18 months you're never moving ahead you're barely keeping where you are think about that in any kind of professional situation if you lose someone it takes you six to nine months by the time you've hired somebody else and brought them up to speed to be back to where you were when that person left and if they're and if they're cycling in and out of your organization at 18 months i mean you're not getting anywhere think about that no wonder you're not growing. No wonder you're not building a, a, a fundraising juggernaut. Yeah, makes sense. Um, we've got a couple questions about how to maintain the the relational um, kind of strategies when when things like face to face visits are not possible, at least in the short term. Um, what, what do you recommend folks do to to maintain those connections? Is it phone calls? You know, Zoom meetings like this. You know, can technology be an aid there? Um, what, oh, what do you absolutely. recommend? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and don't count the old folks out. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, a lot of them are really into that. Yeah. Uh, mainly because they've been limited. In ways long. They don't like it out and, you know, travel the world necessarily. They like stay home a little more. Yep. And um, uh, the key for, because here again, it's a method. It's a one size doesn't fit all. But the beautiful thing about that is, you know, the, the, the digital tools that are available allow you to segment your audience way down to the nth. I mean, it's so easy now. You know, you know, 30 years ago, everything was on pen and paper. Um, you didn't have this. And so you were limited what you could do. But if you're creative, you can do a lot of things. But the key is don't assume what your donors want. We get back to that again. You have to ask them. And, uh, you know, and it, cause if you want to know, Hey, so tell me, Sally, tell me, Steve, you know, would you like it if I called you up? How about a zoom meeting? Yeah. You know? Um, or, and, and they'll tell you, they'll tell you and respect that choice. Yeah. I agree with you on the age. My, my in-laws who are uh, in their seventies, they're doing, um, they're doing their weekly Bible study over zoom with, with other, uh, church members in that age cohort so mm -hmm. and they weren't on zoom before all this so yeah i think people may get surprised by well, the uh, technology adoption <laughs> and, and in that regard recognize that most people meaning over half maybe three quarters now do this sort of thing on their phone hmm. so that okay. um if you look at nonprofit websites less than half of them mobily adapt what does that mean that means you know, the, the gal that does my operations is just turned 30. And I said to her, I said, Danielle, so what, what do you do when you come to a website that doesn't adapt? Oh, I just keep looking. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if she can't read it right away, she's just going to go something else. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, of course, see, there again, a lot of organizations would say, oh, but that's expensive to do that. Well, okay, fine. But look how much money you're missing out on. Yeah. When you don't do that. Next question. Um, we've got some people asking about uh, leadership. I think there are a lot of people listening to this who like what you're saying, but maybe um, the board or their boss, you know, person in charge of the organization tends to lean more towards those transactional type things. We had someone ask about 
you know, their boss was encouraging them to do Giving Tuesday and, and people, you know, obviously like events. Um, what, what should, what advice or pep talk would you have to those people who want to do what you're saying, but maybe they're getting um, kind of a roadblock from, from their bosses or other people in the organization? Well, um, it's going to sound a little commercial, but I'm going to tell you the answer. <laughs> Send them to you. <laughs> well, that's, that's the short answer. But, but the long answer is this. For people to adopt a different approach, they have to have a different mindset. People do what they know and feel comfortable doing. That's period. Whether they're well-motivated or not, they're doing what they know and they feel comfortable. So if you're going to do something different, you have to change the way they're thinking. And this is the bulk of what we do our work in, is training that changes the way people think about this whole process. Um, I say to people that effective fundraising is 90% what you're thinking and 10% what you're doing. And that's so critical. And so um, anything that's going to change the way they think, and that's why, why the, for one reason, every, everything we do is in, in standard English. It's all media-based. It's easy to understand. Um, I mean, one of the things we even do is call the aha moment. Well, because like, aha, now I get it. Now I understand this. But until that mind shift changes, you're going to be pushing uphill. You really are. And so I think, you know, if you, if you can persuade individually, if you can talk about it, the key is, is to get people to understand um, that triangular operation. And you are simply trying to encourage a third party to fulfill their values by funding your organization. That's what you're doing. You're not asking people money for a worthy cause. Not really. If, when it comes to fundraising, if you want to raise money, you need to understand what's actually happening. And that is your organization is merely a conduit to fulfill the donor's desires. And, and until that really is driven home, you know, you're going to have this push. Um, uh, but but it's, it's a matter of changing mindsets. That's what it is. No amount of slick... Um, um, uh, CRMs, uh, Bloomerang notwithstanding, or, okay. <laughs> or other tech tools or anything else is going is, is gonna to make up for it. You know, yeah, the, you're tools right. are only, the tools are only as good as the person using them. Um, you know, you, know you, you, you buy a cheap violin at a dime store, hey, give it to a five-year-old, hey, you know what it's going to sound like. Take that same one and give it to Isaac Stern, oh, you got a whole different thing going on. Mm -hmm. and it's the same cheap instrument, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. So there you go. It's all about the mindset. It's all about who's using it. Other side of the coin, um, a lot of helpful. people in here have supportive boards and leadership, but not really sure how to kind of channel that energy. What should what should board members be doing right now? Is it calling donors? Is it calling those corporate sponsors who maybe be feeling the pinch? What what can they be doing right now? Other than the you know the core governance things, which you don't want oh. to lose. The thing they should be doing right now is just calling everyone and just finding out what's going on with the donor and don't ask them for any money and offer check what's in. going on with us and just say, hey, we want you to, we just wanted you to know. Just check in. People love that. Yeah. People love it. Uh, but don't ask them for anything. Mm -hmm. Don't ask them for anything. Now, they, if someone offers, you say thank you. <laughs> and you say, and then you follow up, you know, right. you know drop, drop them off. That's worse than, than anything. If someone's offered something to you and you say fine and then someone in your office doesn't follow up oh my god yeah just don't ever count on them again All right. right so but oh yeah that's the this is the easiest part for board members they get to because presumably presumably at a board like that they're excited about being on the board they're engaged they believe in what they're doing well and if they, if they like other people say hey steve um i'm i'm at the board at xyz i'm working with you and see what's been going on. I know it's a difficult time for a lot of people. Uh, is there any way I can help you? Okay, and you're gonna tell me. And then you're probably gonna say to me, well, and what's going on at the animal shelter? Well, let me tell you, Steve. And uh, so just let you know, we're still here and we're hanging in there and we'll all get through this. Yep. Well, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna get off the phone and go, what a hell of a guy, yep. wow. You see, everybody's gonna feel good. I haven't Perfect. gotten any of those calls. Of course not. Yeah. Huh? They're too afraid that they're going to insult you. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yeah, a couple of people are saying they've been they've been doing that. Donors love it. You'll never be more likely to talk to them than now. That's true because yeah. everyone's at home and yeah. they're not going anywhere, so you're not going to catch right. them out on an errand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is a perfect time. I love it. Um, there are some organizations here uh, in the chat that are truly in crisis. Their their services are out of whack. You know, they the schools are closed, so they can't be doing the things they're normally doing. Maybe there is a funding gap for some of those organizations. If you, if you're truly in crisis right now, what do you recommend they they how they reach out to those folks? Whether maybe they have that relational support or not, is it is it is it like what you said? Give the donors a chance to to be change agents in that well, story. Can they uh, should they talk about the fact they're in crisis? I guess is the main question. Well, I think what you do is you. And, and however you do this, it depends on the, what channel you use, whether yeah. it's face-to-face -face or video or whatever it is. Um, what you're doing is you're making an outreach to your existing committed donors. Okay. Number one. Yep. And you're saying, um, I just want you to be aware of what's happening with our organization because I know you've supported it. Because you see, when you put your money into something, you already believe in it. Okay. Yeah. So that, but, you, but, but then you say, now we're doing these things to try to stop the bleeding, which should be some sort of program curtailment. You're making cuts. You're not expecting things to be as usual. All right. Not this, oh my God, we, if we don't do this, the world's going to come to an end. No, we're making these cuts. We're making these restrictions. We've, we've done these and things. Yep. We still have a funding gap, a serious gap. Uh, is there any way that you could help us during this critical time? And you just throw it out there. You see, but you don't do this shaming thing or begging thing. That's the worst thing you can do, mm -hmm. you know, because it just turns people off. Um, um, but you show that you're taking, well, it's like, you know, you look at what's happening in the for-profit world. You know, the companies that are, that are saying all our C-suite executives are foregoing their salaries. And we're doing this and we're doing this and we're doing this. Well, right. hey, okay, equal sacrifice. Then you're going to be more likely to step up and help them mm -hmm. instead of, well, you know, we're, we're not going to be making any changes and we still need think we need to save the world. And so we're not going to make any drawbacks, but we expect you to fund us anyway. Mm -hmm. How arrogant is that? Yeah. No matter if it is a good thing, that's not the point. Right. The point is the way it's coming across to people. Mm, I see. Well, what so, about... I've, I've encountered a lot of resistance from people saying, well, we don't want to ask for money because people are, people are hurting right now economically. And that may be true of some people, but is, is that, is that just another example of deciding for the donor before you really know what the situation is? Of course it is. Okay. Of course it is. Yeah. Well, first of all, you don't say, Steve, I need another 50 bucks. I need the 500 bucks. <laughs> all right. You say, Stephen, is there any way you can step up and help us more during this period? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the implication is it's going to be money. All yes. right. And you're going to say to me, Larry, I wish I could. I've been laid off. Um, I'll stay with you, but I just can't afford any more money. And yep. I'm going to say, thank you for your consideration. God bless you, Steve. Yep. All right. I'm not going to say you deadbeat. Why don't you give me more money? Right. All right. So it's, it's, it's all in the way, in the assumption. I'm assuming that you're going to do that. that you're a goodwill. And so I'm going to treat you like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to make the decision for you, but I'm going, to, I'm going to put it out there for you to say yay or nay. And I'll accept whatever you tell me. Yeah. That, that's what builds friendship. That's what builds relationships. It's being out there. You know, see, the people who say that, they're the ones that make fundraising all about money in the first place. Right. It's not about money. Right. Um. Speaking of getting to know your donor, a couple of people are asking about how to, how to get that information about, you know, the reason for giving, the rationale, why they care about your cause. It might be a little too late for this event, but thinking of the next Black Swan event, as you said, what should people do, be doing? Is it formal surveys? Is it those phone calls? It seems like those phone calls could glean a lot of information about the donor. Um, what have you seen work maybe for a new relationship, a first time donor getting to know them and finding out what, what kind of makes them tick? Well, surveys can work. Okay. The, the difficulty with those is that they can come off very packaged and stilted. Kind of formal. Yeah. And then 
people will think, oh, I'm being marketed to Mm -hmm. because we live in a pretty cynical community in that regard. People love to let you tell them what's on their mind. Yeah. They love that. Oh yeah. And, and my experience has been is that if you go about, you know, personal phone calls, whatever, in a systematic way, you know, maybe you got your board members and they have a script they're more or less going through so that you're getting consistent information from everyone Mm -hmm. that, once you have a pretty good sample of people, you would take, you know, you would take a, a segment from each giving level probably is what you would do. Then you're going to have a pretty good idea. You don't have to sample everybody in your organization. Mm, I, I think, I think that, uh, in fact, I know that the profiles will start, will start emerging pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, you don't have to, it's not a matter of numbers here. It's a matter of choosing your, your sampling base correctly and then, and then allowing them to tell you in a, in a, in a very unstructured format, like a phone call with people taking good notes. I mean, I did, uh, one of the things I did my career, a lot of was, uh, uh, feasibility studies for capital campaigns. I, I worked for Ketchum. You know, the, yeah. pre, the pre-minute consulting firm for how many years? All right. <laughs> so they taught me all my bad habits. Anyway, so, oh. <laughs> but, but they were all, those things were conducted where I sat in a person's home or their office and I asked them pretty much a set list of questions, but I did not do it in a rote way. And it was, a, it was a conversation. Yeah. And then I wasn't an interview. That. It wasn't an interview. And so that it, you know, and I'm going to tell you a little secret about consultants. <laughs> the consultants out there are going to hate me when I say this. But when, when fundraising studies are sold, they're sold on the basis of so many interviews. And typically, it's the client that wants all these interviews. All right. Now, I know that you've got to have certain numbers in each category, but you don't have to have all those interviews. They add a little breadth to it, but they don't really change the results. Hmm. And so I can remember doing these studies and I would be into the first three or four days of a two or three week assignment. And my, my vice president would call me and say, so Larry, how's it going? I said, oh, I think it's going to be blah, 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 blah. Okay, we'll finish the uh, uh, interviews, come back and write the report. All right, so I would kind of, I'd get a flavor for it. So let me, from someone who's been through this, I can tell you that if it's done correctly, you know, you don't have to interview 600 people to figure it out maybe 20, maybe 30 at the most. Makes sense. Um, Wow, we're all all about five minutes till the hour. Um, Maybe a a good uh, last question would be, um, there's there's a lot of small shops listening in that that tends to be a big piece of the Bloomerang Committee. And uh, there's some new fundraisers uh, listening in. We've had a couple of questions and comments come in from people that are in their, their first development job ever right now. Um, certainly feeling for those folks. Any specific advice for them that are kind of getting thrown into the fire um, in a, for a unique situation early on in their career? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that uh, you need to get some you need to get some grounding real fast. And okay. I would do that by getting some good training. And quite frankly, okay. I, I got the best online thing that's out there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, online is it, it, you know, this is full bore online with live coaching. This is not getting a, uh, an open source PDF and an email. No, no. And so that's, you got time. I mean, I, I take the time to do it now because uh, you're not going to go to any conferences lately. And I'm not mm, sure yeah, com- good point. I'm not going to, I'm not sure conferences are the way to go anyway, but um, yeah. they're all episodical, but I get some good grounding. That's what I would do. Well, there's tons of webinars. There's obviously good training, like what you mm-hmm. provide. And yeah. we funded some research yeah. a couple of years ago that, that, that found a strong correlation between dollars raised and amount of training, formal training that the fundraiser had uh, participated in. Um, so if you like this webinar, this is more of a Q&A webinar, oh, um, not a complaint, but we it's, got a, other ones. <laughs> it's a, it's a multiplier. Any kind yeah. of training is, if it's a quality training, it's a multiplier. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, I've always been, uh, I, I've always wanted to learn more. I've always taken all the courses I could find. Uh, when I was running programs, um, I had a pretty sizable development, uh, personal professional development budget for people because they knew that was hmm. critical to keeping people. Uh, by the way, the programs I ran, we didn't have any 18 month revolving door. No, no. Yeah, I'm not surprised. We didn't have that. that. 
that may be a good thing to look for if you're applying for jobs is, 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 is there a professional development budget for mm-hmm. maybe an interesting question to ask this is an assignment. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then how many, and then how many times is the, has the job turned over in six years? Mm-hmm. And if it's more than two, my next question is, so what's the problem here? Right. <laughs> what's your problem? You know, right. It can't always be the people that you hire. <laughs> well, this was fun, Larry. Um, it's always, I, I always appreciate you coming on and being willing to just answer random questions uh, with, with no, no prep from total strangers for at least a half hour. So thanks for doing oh, I it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I know, yeah, you, you, you love it. I, I, I love it because, you know, I feel people's, the situation they're in because yeah. I was in large organizations, but I also spent a lot of time uh, counseling in consulting and coaching with small organizations. And I know the challenges they're up against. Yeah. And let me just end with this, this, this point, and that is you, you as a small organization can succeed. It is not a question of how much money you can throw at this or how much high power talent you've got at it. You know, if you adopt the right mindset, you will succeed, period. I love it. Larry. This was awesome. Thanks for hanging out with us. Oh, <laughs> I enjoyed it as always. Hi, everybody, I hope you had a good time and you learned something and it, and it wasn't a total waste. I think there were a couple nuggets for everybody in there, you know, even good. if it took a whole hour. Um, I know we didn't get to all the questions. <laughs> I'm really sorry we didn't get to all the questions that I, I tried to, to touch on. Well, I, many I, here's a, we could. <laughs> I'll make the offer to you. Okay. If you want to, if you want to email me, info at the principles.com. Uh, for the next day or two, I'll answer questions that just come in. Okay. And uh, info um, at yeah. Info at the A principles, and nice. uh, come and come and check me out. He's a good guy. I I I had a feeling he was going to offer that. I didn't think I would have to ask him, but you know, take advantage of it. If I didn't get to your question, I, I'm really I'm sorry about that. I tried to cover all the subjects that were uh, that were in there. There's a lot of good questions. This is always an active group, um, but uh, we will, I'm going to bring up my slides, Larry. So if your screen changes, don't, uh, don't be worried. Um, we got we go. some webinars coming up. Uh, this is a nice way to end the week. We've got uh, a couple coming up next week. Um, my buddy, Sandy Reese down in Tennessee. Uh, if you're an animal welfare organization, you might want to tune into this one because Sandy, um, almost, uh, completely specializes in animal welfare groups. And if you are a new nonprofit, brand new organization. This one's also for you. That's on uh, Wednesday at 1 p.m. We've got lots of other webinars. I can only put one thing on one slide. So check out our webinar page. Lots of cool sessions coming up. We're covering some really kind of diverse topics. That I don't think get enough attention. Um, and we got all of our recordings of all of our past webinars if you missed them. So reach out, reach out to Larry, sign up for his newsletter. I, I like getting Larry's newsletter because it's always got a, a nice uh, pep talk tidbit in there. Um, and that's a freebie. I mean, come on, why not do it? I know you got a lot of newsletters out there, but um, I think you'd appreciate it. So we'll call it a day there. I'm going to email everyone the slides and the recording. Uh, if, uh, if you missed it, you're not hearing this message, but you'll get it anyway. Um, so hopefully we'll see you again uh, next week on another uh, Boomerang webinar. So have a good rest of your Thursday. Have a safe weekend. Please stay healthy out there. We're all thinking about you, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye now. Bye-bye.